Okay, today on the power of our story, we have Debbie Lee. Uh, Debbie Lee is an author, public speaker, and political activist who has traveled the nation telling her son's amazing story and advocating for our troops, their families, and families of the fallen. Debbie understands the sacrifice of our troops make our troops make and that freedom isn't free, excuse me. On August 2nd, 2006, she received a knock on the door that would change forever her life. She was notified that her son, Mark Allen Lee, had been killed in action, becoming the first Navy SEAL killed in Iraq. Since that day, Debbie has dedicated her life to honoring our troops and the families of the fallen, defending our defenders and fighting to keep the freedoms that our troops have fought for. She has worked tirelessly to ensure that our troops and military and Gold Star families have access to respite and important services that help assist recovery after injury or loss. By God's strength, she chose to rise above the most devastating circumstances of her life to impact others' lives, giving them hope and encouragement. In response to her son's last letter home to pass on the love, the kindness, the precious gift of human life, she founded America's Mighty Warriors. And by the way, uh, her son's last letter home is on her website, America's Mighty Warriors and is providing programs that improve quality of life, resiliency, and recovery. Debbie has completed a multitude of cross-country tours, visited Gitmo, and visited Iraq in 2007 and 2010, becoming the first Gold Star mom in history to visit the combat zone where her son died. She has conducted over a thousand media interviews and has been a regular on Fox News. Debbie appeared on stage with Tim McGraw at the ACMAs in 2007, has met with President Bush numerous times, and can often be found on Capitol Hill advocating for our troops. God has equipped me and given me amazing strength and hope, and I want to share that with others. Debbie Lee, welcome. Thank you, Sarah. It's, it's good to be here today and to be uh, amongst patriots and to be able to share, um, you know, a little bit of our story and Mark's amazing story. And then, you know, the choice that we made to start America's Mighty Warriors and continue to support those who would pay the price for the freedoms we enjoy every day. So it's an honor to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, yeah, it is, it is a true honor to have you, I think, as another mother. Um, I, I look at you and you always had my heart, even before my, my son told me that he was going to enlist. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I think you are many people's mother from what I understand the seal community and so many, you have just been a solid force to so many. And so anyway, we would love to hear your story. Why don't you share your story and, and then also how uh, America's Mighty Warriors was found. We'd love to hear more about that also. You bet. Well, um, as you said in your opening, um, August 2nd, 2006 was a day that forever changed our life and Mark's teammates' lives. You know, that was the day that Mark made the choice to willingly stand out in the direct line of fire three times that day, not just once, but three different times, just that day. Um, they had been on a very kinetic uh, enlistment when they were over there in Iraq. I don't remember exactly the numbers, but um, I remember getting an email from Mark and it was 160-ish missions they'd already been on. Um, they got there the beginning of April 2006. So up to that point, they'd done that many missions. And it's, it's really not typical uh, for the SEALs to work with other uh, branches in the military. Usually they're very selective in what they do. Typically they'll go out and do night missions on their own. Um, but they had worked a lot because of the leadership they had, which I'm sure many of you, you know, probably know who Jocko is. Jocko is their task unit commander. And he said, these are skilled warriors as well. And if we're gonna make a difference here in Ramadi, we're gonna to work together with the army. We're gonna to work together with the Marines that are there. So um, they made a huge impact 
uh, when they were there. But uh, as the uh, his teammates learned that we had been notified, then I started to get phone calls from Iraq and we began to piece together uh, the amazing story of what Mark had done just on August 2nd. And uh, if you'd seen American Sniper, he's the third main character in that movie. So Chris and Tay are the two main characters. Uh, Mark's character was played by Luke Grimes and was the SEAL that's killed in combat in the movie. Um, but they show part of that uh, scene in the movie. It's not a documentary, it's Hollywood. And they took a lot of liberty and <laughs> used their creative licensing um, to tell a different story than, than the actual story they really threw Mark under the bus the way they portrayed him in that movie. Not his personality, his character, his heroic actions. But there is a funeral or there is a scene there in the movie on the rooftop where Ryan Job gets shot. And that does give a glimpse into what it was. It was 115 to 120 degrees that day in Ramadi. And they had been fighting an intense firefight for two hours. There were four of the team guys from Charlie Platoon on SEAL Team 3, which was Mark's platoon up on a rooftop and Ryan had just got uh, severely wounded. He stood up in the line of fire and the bullets from the sniper had hit his weapon. So he had severe shrapnel injuries through his head. He quickly dropped to the ground and two of the seals that were with him dropped to their knees quickly to help him and give him aid. Mark could have made that very same choice that day, but his choice was to stand up in the direct line of fire. He had the big gun, he carried, anywhere from 150 to 180 pounds in addition to his weight because of that big gun. It was the 50 cal. And he knew that he could lay down some suppressive fire. His hope was that he could get up there, provide that cover so that the medic could get up to the top and get to Ryan. And Mark was able to do that all by himself. Same place where Ryan had just been shot, knew the sniper probably had eyes on him, but he didn't weigh the pros, he didn't weigh the cons, he just knew it was the right thing to do. And he stood up and provided that cover and the medic got up there and he took one look at Ryan. He said, we got to get him out of here immediately or there's no chance for survival. So then not just once, but a second time by himself, make that choice again to stand up into the line of fire. Again, he was hoping to provide the cover so they could get down and move Ryan off of the rooftop. They did. They sent him off for medical attention and they climbed into their Bradleys and they headed back to the base, which I'm proud to tell you was named Camp Mark Lee in his memories. And I had the privilege of visiting Camp Mark Lee in 2007. Um, uh, it was based out of, of the Bob Falcon in the Georgia Roads up near Baghdad, but uh, they flew in and got me and took me to Camp Mark Lee. And I got to see where you know he slept and where he spent his time and where he walked, where he worked out, was able to go up to the rooftop um, and they were right on the Euphrates River and went up there to the rooftop. It was a moonlit night when I was there. And um, it was a beautiful scene, if there could be a beautiful scene in, in Iraq. It's a very barren um, desert uh, place. But as I sat up there, I totally could just see Mark up there when he was being contemplative or thinking or just spending some time up there, you know, praying and, and focusing on what they were doing. But um, they, were able to get in their Bradleys then and head back to that base that was named after Mark. Um, Chris Kyle told me later he, they were sure Ryan had died. They didn't think there was any way that he could have survived those severe injuries to the head. Ryan did in fact left, live three more years, lived down here in Phoenix, Arizona, and unfortunately died from complications from surgery here three years later. But at that point, they really thought he was gonna die and their hearts are trying to process, the minds are trying to process that. and we watched our Navy SEALs do some absolutely amazing things. At times they seem superhuman to us. When I think about Mark carrying, you know, 150 to 180 pounds and 115 to 120 degree temperatures fighting for two hours, that seems pretty superhuman to me. But they are just as real as you and I are. And their emotions were heavy on their hearts and they were tired. They were ripping their gear off, getting some water to refresh themselves. And the chief came in and he said, we just found 30 of the insurgents that just attacked us. And without hesitation, Mark looked at his chief and he said, Roger that, let's go get them. And so they climbed in their Bradleys and they headed back to that godforsaken place. I know because I've been to Camp Markley, on the other side of that base was a Marine base. And they could have said, go get some of them refreshed and haven't been out in battle and are ready to go. 
but that's not who these guys are. And as they got back into Ramadi and they cleared those houses, they went in the last house that Mark would be in. They cleared the bottom of the house and they started up the steps and they heard Mark yell, on me. And the guys knew what he was saying. He was saying, I got the lead on this. You guys follow me. And as they went up those steps, they drew fire through a window. And for the last and final time, Mark saw the sniper and he turned into the line of fire and sacrificed his life to save his teammates. He knew that if he stayed ducked below the wall, he'd probably lose half of his platoon. He made the choice to give his life to save his teammates. And I just think of, as he said those words on me, you know, that applies to so much that we do in our life and how we live our life. If we're going through struggles financially or in our marriage or with our health or in our families, if we would take the courage and say, on me, and say, come on, follow me. We're going to do this. I'm not going to let this overcome me. This is not going to take me down. And it's been almost, it's been 15 and a half years since we lost Mark. And of course, just recently, as I've shared a little bit more on that topic of on me, I look back and go, oh my gosh, at that time, not in my mind, did I know that's exactly what I was doing, but that's what I did when we got that news about Mark. I chose to put on his boots and pick up his weapon and stay in the fight for every man and woman that served, stay in the fight for every other Gold Star family who's lost a loved one. And that's not something I could do by myself. So without saying the words like Mark did, it's been on me. Come on, folks, we got a mission to do. And I am surrounded by amazing patriots and volunteers who help us complete the mission that we do. And as I said, losing Mark has been the toughest thing I've ever been through in my life. Uh, I've been a widow for 27 years. Uh, unfortunately, lost my husband to suicide. And that was my second marriage. Uh, my children's father was um, very abusive when he drank and did drugs. I didn't know that he did that before with Mary. But we were only married four and a half years, and he had tried to kill me. And um, this was 43 years ago. And for you guys that are in law enforcement, you know that some of the toughest calls are those domestic violence ones when you get there. And most of the time, you know, the next day after the incident, the wife apologize. They don't want to press charges or vice versa. Sometimes it happens the other direction, but typically it's more the men's side. And for you guys, that's, you know, such a risk to go into those. You know, we see that's a lot of the um, casualties and injuries that you guys take. A lot of them are on those um, domestic violence, but my three-year-old sat and watched why my husband tried to kill me. And so at the age of 23, I went through a divorce and had a three-year-old, an 18-month-old, and two weeks later found out I was pregnant with Mark. So there didn't look like there was a lot of light at the end of the tunnel, but I've always been determined that I wasn't going to quit. I wasn't going to give up. I was not going to live on welfare and allow my children, you know, to be raised in a, a system there even though that was very much so, um, you know, his father's family, a lot of them, you know, the way that they were and um, often worked two or three jobs and was not a perfect mom by any means, um, did the best that, that I could in raising my children. And I'm blessed to have, you know, three great kids and uh, 11 grandkids. And next month I have a great grandchild arriving. Not sure how that happened, but I mean, I do know how that happened. <laughs> Um, I, I'm a blessed woman and, you know, to continue to start and to run America's Mighty Warriors, I get to see the difference that Mark is still making. And I can't tell you how many of, uh, you mentioned earlier, my family that's grown, I'm, you know, known um, in the communities, Mama Lee, not just the community, now it's, you know, in the, in the military world and um, even in the law enforcement world that um, I just, Feel like the old woman in the shoe. I have so many children. I don't know what to do now, but it is a blessing. It is a good problem to have, you know, to be surrounded by so many uh, amazing men and women who've served uh, in our military. Uh, that's who our foundation reaches out to, but be connected to so many in the law enforcement and first responder community as well. Um, do a lot with Jocko and Leif and um, Echelon Front. I'm at the Musters, so blessed to meet so many of our law enforcement my uh, father actually was a sergeant in the police department in Greeley, Colorado. Uh, we have some history that goes back that way as well. 
but um, I'm excited to be here today and um, proud to share Mark's amazing story. You know, what he continues to change lives and the impact he makes literally millions and millions of lives have been saved by that young man or changed or been impacted when they read his last letter home and are challenged. And um, Mark's name means mighty warrior. That's the meaning of Mark. And our foundation is not mighty warrior. It's not just named after Mark because there are so many who sacrifice so greatly. And that's why it's America's mighty warriors that our foundation is. And um, I don't know if you want to ask, you know, specific questions about that, or you want me just to go into what our foundation does? Well, I, uh, first of all, I, I feel choked up, um, definitely because of another mother losing uh, a child, but the smile on your face and your courage, oh my gosh. Sorry, never cried before interviewing somebody. So, um, but it's it's beautiful. Your courage is beautiful. You are definitely an on me person. You represent that saying so very well. So, excuse me, everybody. Um, uh, yes, I, would yeah, I, I. I tell people that's my new profession. I make people cry, <laughs> but it's not. It's not a bad thing. That means that you can relate. That you understand. And I never would want any of you that are on here today or who may be listening to have to experience the loss of a child to know the depth of that pain. Um, as I mentioned, I've been a widow. I'd walked through death before. Um, yes, it was different than someone who's maybe married for 50 years to the love of their life. It was not a good marriage. We were only married eight years, but uh, so different in the contrast to losing your child. I've done lots of reading on grief and they say the toughest grief is the instant death of your child, no matter what age they are. And uh, I can attest to that, that was so much harder. But what good would it have done me to curl up in a ball and feel sorry for myself? That wouldn't bring Mark back. And the stress, it physically destroys your body. There's so much uh, issues, so many issues that we deal with in the uh, medical realm that are caused by stress. And if we didn't stress, that wouldn't, you know, we would be healthy. And that's not how God wired me. So if I can be out there encouraging others, supporting them. And again, that doesn't mean that when I started this foundation, I just ignored the grief. You still have to process through that grief. You can't go around it, under it, over it. You've got to go right through the middle of it to get to the healthier side of that grief. I still have people that will ask me, so when did you feel like you got over it? You don't, you don't get over the loss of a child. Does that mean I just pretend Mark didn't exist? I mean, I carried him in my womb. I nursed him at my breast. I don't just forget that, but you do learn ways to cope. You learn ways to manage the grief. You prepare for those tough days of grief. On his birthday and on the anniversary of his death, um, those are the two toughest days that we deal with. And Mark's amazing last letter home, such a gift to so many. But in that letter, he talks about random acts of kindness. He said, when's the last time you paid for a stranger's cup of coffee, meal, or tank of gas? So thank you, Mark, for leaving that letter because that's how we deal with those tough days. I have Mark's letter printed off. We put our hero card, which is my business card, but it has Mark's picture on it. And that's why we call it the hero card. I staple that to the letter and we go out into restaurants and coffee shops and gas stations. And we buy our veterans and our Gold Star families and our troops, we buy those for them. And it is so awesome, the feeling that you get when you're doing for others. And to know, you know that I'm honoring Mark, oftentimes you know, they'll say, oh no, thank you, ma'am, I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm like, no, no, no. My son was the first Navy SEAL that was killed in Iraq. And his last letter home challenged me to do this. So I get to honor him by doing this and thank you for your service. Of course, then what do they say to that? You know, but, oh, okay, thank you. Um, and so you learn to do those things to prepare for the grief, but you've got to go through it. You can't avoid it. And so that wasn't starting the foundation, wasn't, you know, something to deflect. And some people do because they don't want to deal with it. It's painful. And they just stay in the same beginning stages of grief and don't process through, you know, healing to the other side and so the random acts of kindness is the first things that we started doing 
Um, I didn't wake up and go, gee, I think I'll start a foundation. Um, I had recently retired. I had a preschool and kindergarten for 15 years and had just uh, moved down to Phoenix from Oregon and was just planning on, you know, visiting my kids. My oldest son was serving in the Marines. He was in Okinawa, Japan. My daughter and uh, her husband was serving in the Army and they were in Fort Polk, Louisiana. And Mark was stationed down in San Diego. So I figured, okay, I'll just travel. None of my family lives where I'm at in Oregon anymore. So I'm gonna go to sunny Arizona and um, just enjoy life and travel a little bit. Little did I know, you know, how my world would be changed then, you know, shortly after I moved down here. But um, it just happened in a progression. And then once I realized this is kind of where God's directing me, I'm like, okay, well, I don't have the finances to do this all out of my own pocketbook. So we started the foundation. Uh, seven weeks after Mark died, we unfortunately lost Mike Monsour, who was on Mark's sister platoon and in Ramadi, and they had done joint missions together. But yeah, he uh, jumped on a grenade to save his fellow teammates. And we had people supporting us from when we were notified until the funeral. But Mark's teammates were still all deployed in Iraq. Uh, once that funeral was done, we didn't have a lot of support. And as I mentioned, I was a widow. I didn't even have a spouse, you know, to help me through the grieving process. And uh, I'm not a person to feel sorry for myself, but I was like, okay, I can change this so nobody else has to go through this alone. So when Mikey died, I knew I needed to be there for that family. And it was over in San Diego and I got over there and the hotel that I was staying in it was the same hotel that we'd stayed in for Mark's funeral where the family was staying. The same SUVs pulled up to pick them up that had picked us up. Um, he was buried at the same cemetery. And as I was down in the lobby, as the family was getting ready to get in the cars, uh, the Admiral came up to me and, you know, just said, hey, Mrs. Lee, how are you doing? And I'm like, you know, best you can be, you know, I'm processing through the grief, but now we got another one. And even though I'd started to heal my heart a little bit, it started to rip open again. And he said, we want you to get in the vehicle with the family. And I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. This is not about Mark. This is not about me. I'm not here for that reason. I'm here to support that family. And he said, exactly. Who better to know than you? You're a few steps ahead of them. Um, so again, I just would happen to be somewhere. Um, I was in Washington, D.C. several different times uh, when we had uh, a seal come in with his face blown off or another one with both legs blown off. And God's equipped me to encourage and to help. And so I was there, you know, ready to do that. And so officially in 2008, we started our foundation. Oh, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm uh, coming unglued here. Beautiful story. Again, I love your courage. Um, it's wonderful how you have made, you know, this very, very tough, tough thing in your life, losing your son, um, your husband, um, his teammates, and you have taken that and you have marched forward. Um, you are definitely one of my heroes, Debbie. And I'm just so honored to have you. Um, your story definitely encourages and empowers the rest of us. So thank you so much for sharing. Um, really you appreciate it. You bet. Um, one of the main things that we do through our foundation, um, I don't remember which gentleman it was that mentioned he had just written a book I'm bad with um, names. Glenn. Oh, Glenn. Glenn. <laughs> Glenn. So um, our main program right now is our Helping Heroes Heal program. And that is for our veterans, uh, combat veterans who are struggling with post-traumatic stress, traumatic brain injury, and suicidal thoughts. Um, we're paying for hyperbaric oxygen therapy, hormone and vitamin therapy. So natural things that are actually healing their bodies and their brains. Um, I totally get why our veterans want to try anything and everything to get rid of the pain, whether it's the emotional pain, the physical pain, mental pain, or all of the above. I get that. But um, a lot of the self-medicating that they're doing is just doing more damage to them, just destroying them more. It's masking the symptoms. It's not healing them. And so nine years ago, uh, we were started doing some research on the hyperbaric oxygen therapy. and um, we have right now have over a hundred veterans this year going through our program. It's a year long program. So we pay for 40 hyperbaric oxygen therapy dyes. Uh, we 
provide a year of hormone and vitamin therapy. So getting their bodies, as I mentioned about the stress, it depletes their vitamin D, their cortisol goes off the, ch the charts. Uh, their testosterone usually is very, very low. And so if we can get your body back balanced where God designed that to be, then your ability to sleep, um, I usually sleep really well. Last night, I did not go to bed till 4.45 this morning. So hopefully what I'm saying today makes sense because usually it doesn't make too much sense um, when I don't sleep well. But so many of our veterans, the common story, when I talk to them and say, how's your sleep? Not good. When's the last time you had a seven hour night sleep? Uh, and they pause, I don't know, five years, 10 years ago. I'm like, what? You know, when I first started doing that, I'm like, oh my gosh, I wouldn't make any sense anywhere. No wonder their emotions are out of control. That is also related to the frontal lobe where a lot of that brain damage is from the injury and the blast. And so the, um, as we do spec scans, we've tried to make this standard with the DOD and VA that this is a therapy that they pay for, but they just keep saying, it's all in their heads. I've had two calls with two different VA secretaries and they're like, well, there's just not enough research to prove it works. I'm like, oh yes, there is. There's lots of research out there. So we're doing spec scans before and after because they keep saying it's just in their head. I'm like, well, yeah, it's just in their head. Here's their head before and here's their head after. Do you see the healing that's taken place? It's so obvious. Um, but again, you go back to that frontal lobe and I know this relates to you know a lot of the PTS that the law enforcement first responders deal with as well. It, um, it's the sleep, it's the memory, it's the emotions, either no emotions or the raging emotions. And so if we can get those things healed and back in control, then they can deal with the emotional things on uh, the way that our body's designed to handle trauma and you know the tragedies that we go through um, to be able then to do that without the raging emotions, you know, to be able to get those back in control with sleeping well. You know, as I mentioned, if I had one more night like this, I really would have to call you and say, um, can we reschedule that? Because I'm not gonna be able to speak or make any sense and everybody's gonna go, what is she talking about? But um, it has been such an honor to work with them and see the healing that takes place. Uh, obviously we're very heavy in the SEAL community because that's my family. Um, and they hear about the, the program and they're telling their brothers and sisters, but we're open to all branches of the military. Our random acts of kindness that I mentioned, the cups of coffee, meal and tank of gas, that we go up to a $5,000 grant. Um, typically that's crisis situation. Our um, veterans themselves can't um, ask for help because unfortunately we found veterans just going from charity to charity to see what they can take. And that's not who we wanna help. We wanna help those that would be the last one that would ever reach out. We don't want the ones that are posting on GoFundMe every time you know, they stub their toe or can't pay their utility bill or, you know, and, and not that there aren't legitimate GoFundMe once they're out there, but you see some of those people that just anything and everything. Um, so if you guys knew somebody, you could reach out to us and say, here's the circumstances. This is my buddy, you know, uh, I served with them. They served in the military. I've known them three years, five years, 10 years. Their house just burnt to the ground. They hadn't got renter's insurance yet or their child has cancer or we help unfortunately a, a lot with suicide funeral expenses. Um, and for the law enforcement community, if they're veterans, if they've served and have an honorable discharge, we can help them as well. So please feel free you know, to reach out if you know um, those in the law enforcement community that are struggling and that we can support with a random act of kindness or through our Helping Heroes Heal program. The Helping Heroes Heal program, they would just need to have a diagnosis of PTS or TBI from combat. That's really good to know. So, so the message is your brain can heal. You just yes. need to get that support and help yeah. know that your brain can heal, know that you can get help with sleep and all these things that can really exacerbate, uh, post-traumatic stress and your brain condition. Uh, gosh, that's a wonderful, wonderful service. I know I've heard many stories about, you know, going to a certain organization where you just get lots of pills and they feel like a shell. They're on 18 pills, young people. And so, so you are definitely just, you are focusing on the healing process, which is so, so important. So I love that. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Um, uh, Paul, you've got your hand up. 
Oh, <laughs> uh, a couple of things. When somebody is taking 18 pills, they're treating the symptoms and not the cause. And you clearly understand that difference, Debbie, yes. um, more than most. Uh, the other thing that I find that has been very helpful, and some people have heard me repeat this before, but you're having a really down day and things aren't going well and wondering why and all the rest of that. I have found that what helps me is to just go help somebody else. Mm -hmm. Yes. Whether that's a homeless person or whether it's somebody at a gas station who doesn't have enough for gas, whatever it is. Um, and again, that's probably under the category of random act of kindness, except that I go looking for it. Um, because then it transmits to me my self worth to others. Yes. And there are days when you get down. I haven't had any recently. I've been retired for a very long time. Um, but there are times when I worked uh, both in the Navy and as a police officer that just knowing that you could help somebody uh, and then doing it uh, reframed your day, literally. And so I offer that for whatever it's worth. Um, I think it's important to remember. It's not easy to do all the time, but it's certainly worth the effort. Yeah, you're spot on with that, Paul. There's three things that as I work with our veterans who are struggling, and um, we also do a lot for our Gold Star families. And I didn't know what a Gold Star family was till I became one. Of course, that means you've lost someone um, in combat. Uh, who gave their life you know, for our freedoms. And we do uh, retreats in Texas. We have a house in Arizona called the Heroes Hope Home, the Serenity Hope Home in uh, Florida as well, where they come stay free for the week. We pay for their airfare, their rental car, and just love and pamper them and let them know we won't ever forget their and we won't forget them. But as I'm dealing with those who are grieving or those who are, de de are suicidal, I encourage them three things, and yours, Paul, was one of those three, was get up in the morning, and before your feet even hit the ground, find one thing to be grateful for, and um, I'll tell you what, when I first lost Mark, it was pretty hard to have any attitude of gratitude at all. Um, it was painful. I was hurting. I told people, not only was I emotionally hurting, my heart physically hurt. It literally hurt. I'm sure there's some a medical reason that explains that, but my heart really did hurt. And um, as a believer, I've, you know, never heard God, you know, audibly speak, but in my thoughts, he's put, you know, things in my brain and he's like, just be grateful, find something to be grateful for. I'm like, what do I have to be grateful for? You know, I've lost my son. There was no one's here. And, um, the thought was, do you have hot water in your shower? Well, yeah, I have hot water in my shower because a lot of your troops deployed, they're out away from a fob. They don't even have any, you know, water in a shower that day. And it was like, just, okay, thank you, God, that I have hot water in my shower. And there's something that's contagious when you start to do that. Then later in the day, even though you're in the midst of the darkest days of your life, something else is going to pop up. And if you've got that mindset that you're like, wow, thank you. Look, the sun is beautiful outside today. You know, thank you for the sunshine. And you start to develop that. And then I always tell people exercise. Um, I had written an article about two months ago and I'm always telling people there's a feel good endorphin that's released when you exercise. And I thought, ah, I probably should find out this article what that feel good endorphin is called. And so I Googled it and it's just an endorphin, but it said it has the impact of the result of having morphine. And I'm like, what? You know, no wonder we feel so much better when we're exercising. And again, when you're really depressed, when you're in the midst of those dark days of grief, you don't feel like getting up and doing anything. But I tell people, just get up and go walk to the end of your driveway and then challenge yourself the next day. Walk to the end of the block. Okay, next day, walk around the block. Um, I regularly walk five to eight miles every single day. I think the last two years, there's maybe been five days 
where something happened, like I literally don't get back into bed if I haven't, you know, walked the minimum five miles. And I feel so good. It makes such a difference when you're doing things regularly. And then, like you said, Paul, go serve somebody. If it's, it's just walking the neighbor's dog, going to the library and reading kick, you know, books to a kid, anything. When you're giving to someone else, and Paul, you said it so well, you're reflecting on others, not on your inward pain. And it brings such joy to be able to give and do for others. So that was great advice, Paul. Oh, that's fantastic. I'm going to make sure and post that. Love that. Um, so we have Janet and then we'll have Paul ask you or comment. Hi, Debbie. Thank you very much. Um, I, I want to say that the acts of kindness, like they just don't have to be huge. Um, and I, it, it's nothing for me to buy somebody in the lineup and the drive through a coffee and that, but I'll tell you, when it happens to you, it, there's no words. Like I was in a Starbucks lineup and the person in front of me paid for my Starbucks mm -hmm. drink. And, and we don't always know the difference we're making until it happens to you. And I was in a, a, a training where they sent us out to do an act of kindness or something. And I walked in the grocery store and there was there's a, a woman standing outside and she looked like she, you know, might be sad or something. So I went and bought flowers and I came out to get them to her. She wasn't there. Uh -huh. And I went and walked into the coffee shop and I'm holding these flowers. And this woman says, are those for me? And I says, yes, they are. And I give, and she started to cry because she just found out her son was in an accident. So we don't know what's behind yes. the scenes, but if we can do that naturally and I'm very blessed that our grandchildren have lived with us and, and stuff. And my 20 year old granddaughter <laughs> drove around with me one night, just looking for somebody to give some groceries to, because there was a guy outside the grocery store who wanted money. I says, are you hungry? He's yes. Yeah. So we went and we had, you know, we were just looking for things. It didn't look like he had teeth. So we're looking for something soft and that came out and he wasn't there. Mm -hmm. So here we are driving around looking for somebody to give these groceries to. And uh, so thankfully they are getting, and when you talk about hot water, that is my go-to gratitude. Yeah, every every cool. day I'm grateful for hot water. Yes, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. awesome, Jana. And like you said, you don't know that person in front of you, what they've just had or what their news is. And that can change the rest of their day, the rest of their week, who knows? And um, you'd mentioned the you know, grocery store, we were, I was at the grocery store, it was probably two weeks ago now. And there was a gal in front of me in uniform. And of course, as I pulled up, I'm like, okay, we're gonna buy her groceries. And she had a couple of kids with her. And so um, I just, you know, put, reached my hand out. I said, thank you so much for your service and, you know, for defending me and my freedoms. I never take that for granted. She said, oh, well, you're welcome. And we chatted for a minute and um, I don't even remember how the whole conversation went, but um, I said, we're going to buy your groceries today. And she goes, no, no. And she had, you know, quite a bit in there. I think it was $211, $213 that we bought. And she's like, no, 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 you don't need to do that. And I said, you know, no, my son was the first seal killed in Iraq. And this is the way, you know, his last letter home challenged us to do this. And I said, it'd be our honor to do that. So then we chat a little bit while they were ringing her up and she got done. She goes, can I give you a hug? I'm like, yeah, of course. And she said, my husband's actually deployed. And she said, some of these goodies are for a care package to send to him. And I was just like, I was like you that I'm like, oh my gosh. And I got my car and I just started, you know, tears started flowing. And I was like, you don't know the impact that you're going to make. And he was going to be on for the holidays, you know, and she had three or four kids. And I think she had three kids and was pregnant. And um, so we just don't know the impact that we can make. And again, to your point, Janet, it doesn't have to be something big. Mark said, when's the last time you helped a stranger with their groceries into the, or out of their car? You know, it doesn't have to be something financial. You know, um, how often can a smile change? You know, if you just smile at somebody, say good morning or good afternoon, you know, those little things in life, you know, Mark says we could change our world and our reputation as a world just by doing random acts of kindness. 
And I agree completely with that. That's awesome. Oh my gosh. What an inspiring talk. Paul? Uh, uh, Paul. Yes, Paul. We have two Pauls. Paul one and Paul two are both raising their hand. <laughs> hey, Debbie, thank you for sharing. Um, I wanted to let you know the, uh, very quickly, because this is about you and not me, but I want to let you know when I first met you down there in Arizona, I was going through probably the worst trauma of my lifetime. And when I met you that, that day at the uh, special operations event, um, I knew you the real deal, uh, since shared your story with, with my, my bride who works in the court system. And I'll just say, uh, unashamedly that I've followed you over the years and anybody on this group can trust what you're doing. You've been true to your mission. I know when I went through my healing process and brought my company up here to the Midwest, we, we ran, unfortunately, into those that don't have your honor and don't have your, um, your integrity. Uh, a few of those, and I can I could say we found many like yourself up here now, and that you've been true to that mission from from day one. So I just want to encourage you to continue to do that. If people here um, resonate with the services that you provide, they would in fact reach out to you because they you're very trustworthy. You use the money for what you say you're going to use it for, and you're very well respected um, in the networks when removed from us. And very honored that you were here today. Well, thank you. You know uh, that's one of the things that. My board says she's very frugal, <laughs> but um, my passion for, for the troops, I want that money to them. I want to see that they're taken care of. And obviously it takes money to run a foundation. You know, some people are like, oh, a nonprofit, nobody should get paid. Well, how are you going to get good quality people in there? You know, most people can't donate 40 hours a week. Most people can't do, you know, 10 hours a week on a regular basis. You have to get staff. But 95% of what comes into our foundation goes back to the troops, veterans, gold star families. I get so irritated when you find out a charity, you know, 30% is going to the cause and the rest is going to exorbitant salary and, you know, professional fundraisers. You know, people are like, but I see their commercials all the time on Fox News. I'm like, well, they don't give away those commercials. They're paying for that. So that's part of their fundraising expense. And we have been blessed to have amazing people and patriots who do support us, who do the fundraising for us and are advocates for us to help raise those funds and to also share our mission so those that need our help know where to find that help. So thank you, Paul, that means a lot. Okay, Paul Curtis. A couple of simple things, um, perhaps some of them that have already been said, but it's not about the money. It's about how you make people feel after you left. And it is because you raise them up much like you do in servant leadership. Um, and it can happen with a smile, as you said, Debbie. Uh, it can be a simple gesture. Uh, it could be any number of things. And it truly depends on what the need is, what the circumstances are. And that's something we each have to judge as we are exposed to them. Um, but there's a lot of value in just sharing a smile sometimes because it's free, it's infectious, it doesn't take away one iota of who you are to give it to somebody else. And, and I, I've done that both in and out of uniform um, for a very long time. And with regard to gratitude, my notions about gratitude are perhaps a little bit different. I'm thankful for clean water. 85% of the world, clean water. And that's pretty sad. I am thankful and truly grateful for some of the best medicine in the world uh, here in San Diego County. And most of the people in the world don't have that. I'm grateful that I have a nice home. Um, I'm not saying that to be boastful. I'm, that was a choice I made. And 
to be able to host people. Um, I'm grateful for the fact that in spite of my physical defects, if you will, um, I, my intention in life is to be a success and I define success as any movement in the direction of your worthwhile goals. Destination, it is not possessions. It is what are you doing to achieve your goals and how are you going to get there? And I'll leave it at that, but I just thought I'd share that with you. Yeah, that's awesome. I love that. Our attitude and, you know, as I said, when we were notified about Mark, I had no choice, the news that was given to us. If you're su suffering with physical things or other issues, lots of times we don't have a choice. Sometimes, you know, I can look back at some of mine, it's my own stupid choices that I made that caused that. But lots of times we don't have a choice, but we do have a choice how we respond to that. You know, and that all of us, I don't care who we are, what our background is, what our educational background, we all can choose to do that, you know, with our will. And I think, uh, you know, Mark, you know, going through Hell Week, you know, or any of the guys that go through Hell Week, the majority of the time, their body gives out way before. I mean, physically, the body is spent. It's used up. There's nothing left. And it's their mind that says, nope, run one more stride, swim one more stroke, don't quit, keep going, keep going. And even though that body really is physically to the point of total exhaustion, they complete that week. And it's more that mental struggle, you know, and that mental fortitude and that mental determination that, you know, keeps us going. And we all have that choice. That's great. That's such a powerful reminder to remember. It's about how we respond to whatever life throws at us or just make, you know, good decisions, whichever the case may be. Um, what is your life like right now? Like, what is life like for you now? You know, these years later, all these years later, and are you, are you finding, do you have joy? Are you enjoying I life? I, I have, uh, a lot of joy. I'm very content where I am. I'm very blessed. Um, I, as I mentioned, I have 11 grandkids. Five of them live near me. I had a preschool and kindergarten for 15 years. So I love, love, love kids. Um, I take, you know, at least usually once a week, we have a sleepover on the weekend. The oldest one that's close to me here is 15 now and involved in sports. So um, sometimes he's not here as often. And sometimes now their schedules because they're all involved in sports except the little girl. Um, it's kind of crazy to coordinate that. But, but typically we still can do it three out of four weekends. Um, I'm not traveling as much as I used to, you know, with COVID, but I love having them here. Um, I really find so much fulfillment, even though it can be emotionally draining, the things that we do with our veterans who are you know, suicidal or struggling with our Gold Star families, it brings so much fulfillment and joy to see the difference that it makes in other people's lives. I love to swim. Um, I, like, like you, Paul, I'm blessed with a beautiful home. Um, it's the Heroes Hope home where our Gold Star families come stay as well. It's also where our offices are, so we don't have to pay for additional um, office space, but um, it's, you know, I love to swim in the summertime. I don't keep the pool. So in the wintertime, you won't find me out there because that water's probably 50 degrees and I'm not a Navy SEAL, even though I raised one, but um, um, I, I, I love walking. I love being outdoors. I think that's why Arizona excites me so much. Um, I love to hike and just enjoy. Um, if any of you follow me for a while, you know, I'm a huge sunset person. I love sunsets there's something that just draws me and so uh, I do sunset walks often and take pictures and my grandkids know if we're driving it's sunset time grandma's probably going to need to pull over to take pictures of the sunset but um uh I you know God gives me the strength to do what I do every day um I have an amazing you know relationship with him and um look forward to what he continues to do with me here on earth but um Anytime he wants to call me home and look forward to what heaven has to offer too. But um, I will stay here and fight with joy my mission until he calls me home. But thanks for asking about that. I don't know that I've been ever asked that question, but. Mm. Well, that makes me so happy. 
you mm-hmm. know, just to see your joy and your faith. I'm going to yeah. start crying again. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay. Let's go on to the next question. Uh, Ryan. Hey, Miss Debbie. Uh, thank you for tuning in with us today. It's been an absolutely inspiration. Um, I just wanted to just pretty much tell you thank you and just, you know, you've inspired all of us, I would imagine, so much. And you, you really uh, have done so much more than what, you know, we could ever imagine for somebody in your position. So just wanted to say thank you and, you know, looking forward to following you and following your organization for the work you guys are doing. Well, thank you, Ryan. That, that means a lot. Um, I can do what I do because I am surrounded by amazing people, you know, who help me do that. And um, Sarah, you had mentioned earlier about my family. Um, that's my blood family, <laughs> but I have such a huge family. Um, Mark's teammates, you know, I told them early on that Mark loved to give gifts. He was my kid that literally would go hunt for hours to find just that perfect gift. But he was so excited about that gift that he couldn't wait for you to open it. So I remember one Christmas he bought me, um, I had China and it was white with gold uh, rim around it. And so he bought gold flatware to go with it. Not solid gold, but, you know, golden color. And he was so excited about his find. And he came home and of course it's all wrapped in Christmas paper. He's like, I got your Christmas present, mom. I'm like, cool, put it under the tree. He goes, no, mom, you, go, you got to see this. This is so cool. I'm like, no, put it under the tree. If you don't put it under the tree, I won't have anything to open Christmas morning. And um, as I said that, he just ripped the package open and opened it because he wanted me to see it immediately and to enjoy it immediately. And um, after Mark died, I thought, you know what? Mark's final gift to me was his teammates. And he intended for me to rip that open and get to know them right away. And um, I don't know if any of you follow Jocko and, and Leif at Echelon Front, but Leif often says, you know, the night, that Mark was killed, you know, they waited till they knew that I had been notified and then, you know, reached out, called me. And Lace was the one of the first ones that I talked to. And he said, you know, I'm just like, oh my gosh, how am I going to comfort this mom? What am I going to say to her? What's this call going to be like? And he said, you got on the phone with me, you were comforting me. And he said, it, it, it blew me away that that's who you were. And so I, got to know those guys. I'm like, send me a picture. I got the platoon picture up here on the wall and they all have code names. So, you know, there's Biggles and there's Dauber. And I'm like, and they talk about them like, okay, who's who? Could you give me real names? And I'll just write it on your picture. So I know you. And I ask when their birthdays were, you know, where, where's your family? Are you married? Do you have kids? And back then, most of the Mark's teammates were, were not married or had kid, um, had kids. Very few of them did. And I really got to know them and I would write to them and, you know, if they had a chance, they would call and we developed that relationship. So when they came home, um, we, you know, met shortly um, after they arrived. I didn't want to take time away from their families. I was there on the flight deck when they all came in um, to be there to say, who the rest of my boys are home, not to be, oh, there's Mark's mom, you know, and, but let them spend time with their families. And then we gathered and um, spent time together. And we still do. I mean, I stay at their houses. We do things together often. And um, uh, we had gathered in January, I'd met with President Bush and had taken the platoon picture of these guys and was telling about who they were, and, you know, amazing men they were. And um, they had just returned home when I had met with President Bush the first time. And um, after I left, I'm like, oh, I missed an opportunity. I should have had the president ask if he would sign a picture to each one of the guys that I could give them. So I reached back to my contact at the White House and they said, yes, of course, he'd love to do that. So he personalized to, you know, each one of the boys and a message and then signed his name. Well, I got those in January, was going over to have dinner with all the guys. And um, to my surprise, they put me up in the presidential suite at the Marriott Hotel. One of the guys was dating the gal who was in charge of the food service there or the hospitality service. So I'm sure they got a pretty good deal on the room but when they told me that and they had no idea that I was bringing the president the pictures from the president over to them and so when I got there and they put me up in the presidential suite I'm like oh my goodness that that's not a coincidence and so um I had them it's huge suite you know (laughs) 
So I had them over to the suite for dinner that night. And uh, I was presenting the pictures to them. And when I gave that to them, I shared Mark's, you know, ability to give gifts and how much that meant to him. And then I said, Mark's final gift to me was you guys. And uh, what a blessing, you know, that is and continues to be as my family grows exponentially. And it's not, you know, just the Charlie boys. I used to be very protective. Um, they started calling me Mama Lee. The week that Mark died, we had some of his other friends who were not on Charlie platoon that were in our home. And he tried to explain the brotherhood. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I get it. You're close to these guys. But as, as close as your brother you grew up with for 28 years? Yeah, mom, that close. And when we had them in our home, I saw that. And I was like, oh my gosh, they love Mark as much as we do. And they're hurting just as much as we are. And that's when they started calling me Mama Lee. And I was very protective. Only Mark Charlie platoons and his swim buddy, you know, a few really close ones could call me Mama Lee because it was about a relationship. They had that relationship to Mark. That's that brotherhood. And then, you know, as I worked with the veterans in our program, I saw that bond and they're like, can I call you Mama Lee? You know, and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is healing for them to have that relationship. They're telling me things that they probably wouldn't tell their own mom because they want to protect, you know, their mom and can open up. And as I said before, I'm like, you know, the woman in the shoe that has so many children, she doesn't know what to do. And I am blessed, you know, to now it's anybody that wants to call me Mama Lee. I think more people see me as Mama Lee, you know, than know what my real name is. So. Uh, you know, it's a respectful thing and an honor to, to be called that. And I love, love, love that. So. Oh, I just, I love that. I just spread so much love and um, yeah. Healing. I yeah. mean, just healing yes. those yeah. connections and, you know, the, the realness of all that and really, you know, staying as a family and uh, that's so powerful. Uh, uh, Glenn, you have a question? Sort of a question, a comment. Um, thank you, Debbie. Um, your your outlook on gratitude and relationships is refreshing to hear in today's world, and I am grateful for that. I, when I was going through my dark times, I realized the relationships I had at that time didn't work. Um, the only ones that ever re that reached out to me were my family, and you've created a huge family, and that's. Um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to be part of a group like this of similar like-minded people because it raises me up. And as I give to the people I talk to, that also raises me up. Um, and I'm grateful for that opportunity and opportunity to be here. Um, you're amazing. <laughs> you're... So keep up the great work because, wow. Thank you. Yeah, I always tell people I have an amazing God that gives me the ability and the words and the compassion and the heart. So, yeah. Beautiful. Thanks for sharing, Glenn. And then we've got David also who has a question or a comment. Hey, I'm usually not. A, thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity, Sarah. I, I'm generally not a person that's lacking of words. However, uh, thank you. And you are just as much a national treasure as your son. And it's such an inspiration. And, and the world needs more people like you. You're, you're truly incredible and inspirational. And thank you so much for the work that you do, uh, for the sacrifices that you've made and that Mark has made. And the, the work you can think of is honor. It's so super special. And thank you so much for that. And beyond a thank you, I always just want to say. Thank you, David. God bless you. <laughs> well, there's a lot of love coming to you on the chat, by the way, just to let you know. And um... even look in the chat. So sorry, <laughs> folks. I get so. I'm very much, as you can tell, a relationship person. So I'm just looking at the eyes and looking at people and listening to what you're saying. So I will click on the chat there. <laughs> I think that's the hardest part for me doing this is to somehow be able to navigate the chat. I'm terrible. So I take maybe one little moment and I'll look at it. And, um, but I just, you know, I think another thing that I'm thinking too, until somebody else raises their hand, um, you really, really model what it is to live. 
you know, after something hard happens, you're a beautiful example of getting up and uh, living, you know, with uh, graciousness and with faith and heart and love and absolutely being proactive. And I just, I love that. I love that about you. Um, yeah, I feel like you're a soul sister, um, an inspiration to me. Um, so yeah, totally just very grateful that you're here sharing your story and your insight in how to live, how to go on. Yeah. Because we, again, we have that choice and, and I won't ever, um, put anyone down that doesn't go for it. Cause I get the pains so hard and not everybody can control, you know, their feelings and their thoughts and make that choice, you know, they can, they just don't realize that they can't. And so they can't step up to that place to be able to do that. But man, for me, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to be there. I don't want people to feel sorry for me. I don't want people's sympathy. Like you said, I want to live. God has given me this life. I'm still here. Mark successfully completed his mission. He did what he was supposed to do in his 28 years. He's redeployed to heaven, but I'm still here. So there's something that I'm still supposed to be be doing. And not that you don't still enjoy life because we are supposed to enjoy the fruits of our rewards, but just to, to lay around, hang by my pool all day long or hike all day long, or, you know, there, this brings that purpose into life. This is my mission. This is my why. And, you know, we look at so many of our military in the transition that we lose because they don't get that new mission. They don't get that new purpose. Um, I was blessed and that God just directed me and said, this is it. I didn't have to search for it. I didn't have to figure it out. And, you know, maybe in a lot of our lives, we're trying to figure it out too hard. And if we just stop back and listen to what God's telling us, we, you know, realize what that is, but we all have to find our purpose. We all have to find our mission that drives us. I was in a uh, veterans round table with one of our candidates for governor here. And they kept talking about jobs, 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 jobs. And I'm like, uh, yeah, that's important to get the guys transitioning out jobs, but more important is to find them something that they're doing that that's the job that's their purpose and mission, not just stick them in a position to say, okay, here's your job. Now you've got income next. You know, we've got to keep them inspired and find that reason that they do want to live, you know, they do want to carry on. So I think that's important. It almost seems like too, like your three points of, you know, getting up and before your feet hit the ground, be thankful for one thing, exercise, and then go serve somebody. Don't you think basic, basic things like that are what unfold the purpose, meaning yes. of life? Yeah. Like I said, I did not wake up one day and go, I'm going to start a foundation. It was in the circumstances of getting up and going and just serving, you know, Mike Monsoor's family, just being there for them. And then, you know, someone else in the hospital, you know, I live in Arizona, you don't just happen to be in Washington, D.C., um, that I was there when those, you know, two gentlemen came in. Um, Dan Knotson was a Navy SEAL who lost his legs. I was down in his room as he was landing in the helicopter on the rooftop. That's how perfect the timing was of that. But um, I think, you know, especially as a believer, and I don't know where everybody else stands here on their faith, but as a believer, when we just say, you know, it's kind of like our men and women in the military, send me, I'll go. And so when we just say, I'll, you know, I'll do whatever you ask me to do, God, which was, you know, what I said the night Mark died um, after everybody left my home and I, you know, opened my Bible and it opened to Psalms 27, which says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and my foes, they stumbled and they fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart not, shall not fear. The war may rise against me. And I'm reading this going, okay, this probably was never in the Bible before. God probably wrote this today and stuck that in there for me. And the second to last verse said, I would have lost hope if I had not believed I'd see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he will strengthen your heart. We just happened to be celebrating my birthday that night at my small group in my Bible study. 
and my girlfriend had given me one of the willow tree angels and those are the wire angels with the wooden uh, wooden angels with the wire wings love that uh, it's a collector yeah and each one has a different character quality so if you look at the bottom of the angel it has whatever the character quality is and the one she gave me was courage and so when i read that scripture with courage at the end of the line i'm like oh, okay god i get it i was a rebel in my 20s i learned to obey you uh, it may not make any sense, but okay, I'll walk through whatever doors you open. Mm -hmm. And in my thoughts, he said, I want you to read this at Mark's funeral. And I know it's probably like a teenager did that uh, and rolled my eyeballs like, are you, are you kidding me, God? That's my son's funeral. I don't know what I do. I don't know if I'll throw up, pass out. Mm -hmm. And I just paused and I said, okay, I'll walk through whatever doors you open. Thinking it just meant to read that and share that at Mark's funeral. And so to see where he's led me, how he's directed my path, the people that, you know, he's crossed path to support what we're doing, those we've been able to help in what we do. Um, I think it's in that getting up and that going and doing that then lots of times that mission is presented to you. And um, I, I don't know what to say, you know, that God chose me, gave me that privilege to be, be able to do that as it's pretty amazing. Mm. Even I mean, a rebel. God can use even a rebel. <laughs> Debbie, um, yes. given the size of your family and the size of my family, we could join forces and create a new political party. Oh, well, that would depend on where you stand politically. <laughs> I'm slightly to the right of Attila the Hun. Oh, okay. All right. We'd be good then. <laughs> If I can just if I can just chime in, um, I don't have the hand raising option on my Zoom, so I apologize, Debbie. I have to say, first of all, I truly commend you for everything you've done, everything you've lived through, and then coming through it and being such a power of example and and living on the other side. What you were sharing about Mark and how it's transformed you as an individual going forward, I really have to believe that Mark's heart is with you every step of the way in moving forward. And it, I feel like it's such a driving force pushing you in, in just in such a solid way. Yeah, I agree. I agree a hundred percent. So, yeah. Thank you. It's beautiful, Terry. Uh, Paul, number one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I just have to say one more thing. Mama Lee, thank you for um, talking to about some of our brothers and sisters that have lost their lives to suicide. That's, that's why I do what I do because I lost my uh, brother from Cairo and then our old unit lost 22 in Fallujah from Lansing and uh, it drives everything that we do. And I appreciate your courage. Um, others nationally that are speaking up about the good use of medicine, but also the naturalistic approach to the biochemistry being tweaked, which there's so much research out there and so much definitive science that's making a difference. Um, so I think they're both needed, but there's a lot that can be done where you're being an advocate. And I just hope you'll continue to speak out with the platform that you have for that because it's helping um, our warriors heal and not just tap the pain down and be zombies. I really appreciate that. I had um, a phone call just this morning before I got on the call that was, uh, it happens to be another CEO, but no, this one wasn't, this one was the EOD. And um, I always have a conversation once we get the completed application, I have a conversation with them that can be anywhere from 15 minutes to a half an hour just to hear from them that they're committed to this process. You know, they have to sign on the application, no alcohol, no tobacco, no tobacco products, no marijuana, no CBD. If we're spending 15 to $17,000 on this year long program to heal your body, if you're doing those things at the same time that are destroying the cells, you're not gonna see that great impact. You're gonna be disappointed when you get done. Our donors are gonna be like, why are you paying for something that's not doing any good? And I said, it's not gonna benefit either one of this. And you know, um, I hear that they, this is a lifestyle change that they want to make, not just a, I want to go get a quick fix and then go back to the way life was. 
but he and his wife, um, when I called, were just finishing breakfast. And I said, oh, I can call you back. He goes, no, 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 we're just stepping outside. This is perfect. And uh, he said that she'd ask him, so what's your main goal that you want? And he said, um, he's got three little kids. And he said, I want my three little kids to be able to have a relationship with me and not look at me as a monster. He said, my anger is terrible. And um, that's just one of the symptoms and the, the impact that it has on so many of them. And, um, you know, I was telling him, hey, this is my cell phone I'm calling from. You keep this number. And if you get in a dark place, you call me. You know, I said, you know, my husband committed suicide. So you're not going to say anything that's going to freak me out or scare me or cause me to do something, you know, out of panic. I will be there to listen to you. I will be there to be able to encourage you. I will remind you that healing is taking place, that there is hope. And so many of these guys and gals have lost hope. They, they're in so much pain. They feel like they have no purpose. And if this, this is how I have to live the rest of my life, I'm done. Um, and so to be able to see the change that's made, to see the healing that takes place. And um, I don't remember what the, uh, I just got an email the other day, Paul, that they are able now to do and it's supposed to be at no cost to our veterans, a testing mm -hmm. with your DNA and the drugs that you're being prescribed to mm -hmm. see the impact that you will have. Um, mm -hmm. Because so many of them, two thirds of the medication they are getting from the VA for depression um, and uh, you know the PTS, two thirds of those have a side effect that says may cause suicidal tendencies. Mm -hmm. And we wonder why our suicide rate so high yeah. So if they can develop some of those things ahead of time with your unique body and test that, you know, like I said, I got to do more research on it. I just got this email, but I'm like, well, that's a major step um, to be able to, and supposedly VA is supposed to offer this without a cost to the veteran to determine this. So. Thank you. That's good to hear. I heard that they were going to do that at some point. Um, just in general. And so it's good to hear that something's happening in that arena. That That's really great. Yeah. Um, so it's about 1215. Um, does anybody else have any comments or questions before we wrap it up today? Just to say thank you for a great session and a lot of learning. Um, I just want to spend time with you. <laughs> me too I'll, I'll cook i make great awesome stuff. i'll come and stay and cook for everybody and awesome <laughs> it's a deal <laughs> and i'm a great grandma too so oh yeah it's just my grandkids call me grandma i've never had a code name I, I i'm very proud of being a grandma but and i'm excited to be a great grandma but i'm like ooh, great grandma that sounds like an old lady with a great bun on her head that's walking around going, hey, hey Shani, what are you saying? No, it's Gigi. I'm that's Gigi. Well, Gigi. And my mom is Triple taken. G. Because my Gigi's mom's already old. taken in our family. That was my grandkids' great grandma on my daughter's husband's side. And she's passed <laughs> away. So I thought that would work, but I get it. They still have memories of Gigi. And so they want to keep it that way. So we're still. My other, my other, some of my other grandkids here are trying to figure out a code name. So, <laughs> oh, that's cute. Yeah, you and Janet would be wonderful friends. I, yeah, Janet is awesome too. We've really loved having her on the first responder group. Um, well, well, I love this format of being able then to, you know, meet you guys and you know share back, have conversations, and I, I love this format. This is great. Well, you know, it's been a great, it, we just, we have families. That's what we feel like these calls are. And um, just, you know, great connections offline to people even start things um, together. And so, and we really love to welcome our storytellers in and just become part of the tribe, be part of the connection. So it has just been, it's really been wonderful to have you, Debbie. You, you are so inspiring. Um, I am not a crier. You would never know it by this call. I think I cried through the whole thing. Um, mm -hmm. it, I, but I think it's, it's your joy. It's your, uh, see, I'm going to start crying, <laughs> but you are truly an inspiration, truly a light. And, uh, thank you for, thank you for coming and sharing who you are and your story. 
Well, and like I said, the light that you see shining through is what's coming down through from above. So, uh, and I didn't get to see all those chat comments. So if you guys, you know, my email address is America's mighty warriors at gmail.com. Feel free to shoot me an email or um, reach out. I, I would love to, to hear from you. That's wonderful. 